Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very powerful show coming right up with special guest Sally Helgeson, and she's here today to talk to us about her new book, How Women Rise. Now, as an author, speaker, and consultant, it's been Sally's mission to always help women recognize, articulate, and act on their greatest strength. Her previous books include The Female Vision, Women's Real Power at Work, and the bestseller, The Female Advantage, Women's Ways of Leadership. Her groundbreaking, The Web of Inclusion, A New Architecture for Building Great Organizations, was cited in the Wall Street Journal as one of the best books on leadership and is credited with bringing the language of inclusion into business. So let's welcome to the show, Sally. Thank you, Marianne. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, what an honor it is to have you here. And my goodness, once I got my hands on your book, I just had to have you on the show. What a profound book. My goodness. Thank you. Yeah, I, we're we're getting very, very good response. I think the, the timing is right and the message seems very resonant with women. Mm. Well, and and for our listeners that are new to your work, I would love for you to share the inspiration behind this book. I just love this story. Okay, fine. I have been working with women leaders and aspiring women leaders around the world for the last 30 years uh, since my book, The Female Advantage, Women's Ways of Leadership, came out in 1990, still in print. And uh, so I've had uh, an opportunity to witness um, the the emergence of women into positions of real authority and influence, and I'm happy to say uh, to be part of that. So that's been a very encouraging thing. My mission has always been uh, consistent throughout this whole time to help women to recognize, articulate, and act on their greatest strengths. To that end, uh, in starting about 2011, I developed a workshop for women that I was delivering all around the globe on being um, developing the capabilities of being visionary, intentional, connected, and present. And for the intentional part of that workshop, I began using a wonderful book by a friend and colleague, Marshall Goldsmith, called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And it is about how the same behaviors that help successful people get to their middle of their career can also get in their way as they seek to rise to the top. So it's a wonderful template, very thoughtful, uh, developed for Marshall's coaching practice. Uh, Marshall has been last eight years voted the number one executive coach in the world, so he knows whereof he speaks. He's been in this career for almost 40 years. And um, so I found the book very helpful, but... Uh, the overriding idea, but as I was using it in my workshops, it was very clear to me that a lot of the behaviors that he focused on that get in the way of successful people were very male-centric behaviors, which is not surprising given that his coaching base is mostly CEOs, so it's about 80% male. Uh, for example, he would have things like, um, you need to learn to apologize, and uh, that kind of made me and the women I was working with laugh because uh, we all know women who can't open the door without apologizing for the fact that they opened the door. So uh, that's not exactly a behavior, you know, that that threatens to get in women's way. And he had uh, he had a behavior in there about, you know, don't talk all the time about how great you are. And and many women struggle to to talk about how great they are at all, uh, even when directly asked. So. It was clear to me that while the template, the overriding idea of behaviors that serve you well early in your career, getting in your way as you seek to rise, was a strong one, the behaviors weren't exactly right for many women. So I suggested to him, why don't we collaborate on a version of this book that would look at the behaviors most likely to get in the way of successful women as they seek to rise further. And that the result of that is How Women Rise, co-authored by me, Sally Helgeson, and uh, Marshall Goldsmith. And it uh, it came out in April, and we're having a lot of fun with it. (laughs) Well, it's easy to see, Sally, why Forbes has called you the world's premier expert 
on women's leadership. And I'm so glad that you collaborated with Marshall Goldsmith on this book. It's a very profound book. One of the things that, no, of course, my goodness, I mean, what a joy it is to be able to spend this time with you to talk about it. One of the things that I would love for you to share with our listeners um, is the difference between how men and women define success, because it seems that there's a little bit of a um, kind of a, a split in some categories when that's, you know, brought up. I think that's traditionally been true. I do think it's been changing, but I'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, mm-hmm. Traditionally, uh, in uh, men in organizations have tended to define success based pretty much entirely upon position and salary. And organizations also reward successful, reward good performance with those two things, with a higher position and a larger salary. So that's, that's, that's a very, you know, organizations have been structured in that way. And until fairly recently, organizations were structured almost entirely for men. But what I've discovered, and I really discovered this when researching my last book, The Female Vision, Women's Real Power at Work, is that women often define success a little bit differently. Um, uh, they feel that a job or a position is truly and deeply engaging to them if they have some degree of control over their time. Uh, that doesn't mean not being busy, not being under pressure, but that they have some degree of control over their time. As if they, uh, if they can build successful and rewarding relationships in the course of their work, but also outside their work as well. If they have um, the the time and the encouragement to do that, and above all, that that they enjoy their days, um, that they feel that they get to show up for and enjoy most of their days, not all of their days. We're human, and none of us will ever enjoy every day we have. Uh, but that that was very important uh, to women. And when I would interview women who had left jobs that look great on paper uh, in terms of salary, in terms of traditional rewards, in terms of position, most of them would say, I decided it just wasn't worth it. And I thought, what does worth mean in that context? Worth indicates different, a slightly different structure of values. So I think that that's something that women have really brought to organizations. Let's not just look at the salary and position when we're talking about success, let's also look at the quality of our days, the quality of our relationships, um, our ability to use our time in what we feel are productive and meaningful ways. And I think that women have had a big influence on organizations in terms of bringing some of these conversations uh, to the fore uh, at least these are conversations organizations are having now, often using them under the, the sort of uh, rubric or uh, terminology of engagement. Um, but I think that's been a great gift. And I also think that it's somewhat beginning to change because I hear all the time uh, from managers and leaders in organizations um, that young men as well, when they're hiring, also seem to have you know, a desire to have jobs that in which they can find a sense of purpose and meaning and in which they can feel that they can create enjoyable and harmonious, if you will, lives um, that that uh, don't just completely get consumed by work and by the race for uh, traditional definitions of success. Well, and on that note, what are some of the things that have surprised you about this book? Well, I would say the thing that has probably surprised, well, a couple things. One of the things that has surprised me most is how many men have told me not just what I thought they would say is this book is really helpful to me in terms of uh, managing women who work for me uh, managing the relationships of the women I work for, managing uh, colleague relationships, understanding my wife and daughters, etc. I was prepared for that, and of course I've heard a lot of lot of that. But I've also heard from quite a number of men 
who come up either it can be at a program or an event I'm doing because I've been all around the country over the last two months, or it can be in a, a radio show or podcast, of which I've done quite a few, uh, men will say, you know, some of these behaviors, I feel that I identify with them too, um, particularly men who are a little more introverted, who might be, say, engineers or other subject uh, matter expertise uh, or have other subject matter expertise. I hear that a lot from men. And um, and I'm I'm fascinated because what it has led me to conclude is that, in fact, these are human behaviors. They're not women's behaviors. They're human behaviors, human habits, but they are the habits most likely to get in the way of women as they seek to rise. Are you also finding that like um, men, as far as managers or leaders, are purchasing your book so that they can better understand how to mentor, if we're talking like sales teams or yes. um, teams of women and, and mixed individuals and how to better how to be a better leader, how to better apply these techniques to their leadership skills. Yes, definitely finding that. And I think that there's so much orientation, again, very positive in organizations now around teams and team building as opposed to, you know, just where the leader stands. Excellent leadership is really recognized now as the ability uh to to build and facilitate uh, engaged in productive teams. So uh, we're definitely we're definitely seeing that. And that's one of the many reasons I feel that the, the timing is very, very good on this book because anybody, man or woman, seeking to build a powerful, high-functioning, high-performance team in their workplace can benefit by reading this book because they can identify some of the behaviors that may be holding some of the women, and in fact, some of the men back uh, from being better performing. Well, and I can agree with you more. This couldn't be a better time than now to have this book out, especially if there are so many women out there looking to develop their voice and be better at their job and um, in ways that they find that are impactful for them. Yes, exactly. So there's much more willingness, and we see it in everything from the press to par- for parody uh, to the hashtag me too, we see all these occasions in which women are saying, I want to use my voice. I want to use my voice for positive change. I want to step up and talk about what my experience is and more, more honesty and more comfort with that. So I think that, uh, that that's one of the reasons we're, we're really hitting a nerve. I, I just had a LinkedIn message this morning when I looked and it was from, a company in the Netherlands that has 100,000 employees that feels that this book is going to be, you know, sort of an answer in terms of some of their um, cross-cultural teams that they're trying to develop. So we we are striking a nerve, and uh, and I'm really glad. You know, again, I said, Marianne, I've been doing this for 30 years, mm-hmm. and the environment yeah. has not always been so receptive. Um, there hasn't always been the the openness of willingness to consider what women may have to contribute. Um, you know, the idea when we when we started out really coming into the workplace in the late 80s was, you know, put on your bow tie and adapt to the culture you find. You're not going to change it. I think it was naive to think that one half the human race could come into the workplace and begin assuming positions of power and influence without changing things. Um, but... Uh, uh, but it, it really has been a great uh, source of excitement, privilege, and confirmation for me to watch the environment begin to change in ways that reflects the message I've been working to put out there for 30 years, but also really affirms the extraordinary value of what women have to contribute. Well, and thank goodness for you and women like you who have been like the lighthouse for many women around, you know, not just the United States, but obviously the world, who are looking to have that positive impact and to, you know, in some ways it feels like almost reclaiming your power in the workplace, you know, because it, it's been so unrecognized for so long. Claiming the power because it, it really has not been, um, you know, it hasn't been manifest 
and uh, mm-hmm. and I think women increasingly have the conf- confidence to do that and um, you know recognize that well, what I have to contribute this organization um, really needs uh, so I'm going to find a way to do this and and that's what really the the, the the goal is here is having an impact is helping women have a bigger impact and that's what we mean when we talk about uh, successful women. We're not saying, you know, this is for CEOs or this is for women who are at the, you know, the level right below CEO who want to become CEO. Yes, can they benefit from it? We believe so and have heard feedback that confirms that. Um, but but this is really for however you define success. Success is always going to be uh, the ability to have an impact and the ability to really make use of whatever your distinctive gifts are and have them appreciated, have them recognized, um, have them confirmed. And that's what, that's how we're defining success in this book. And, you know, again, I think that's a more, a more modern or contemporary, um, way of defining, uh, success than just, you know, position and salary. Mm-hmm. Well, and so, what are some of the common beliefs that women hold that you find tend to hinder their success? Yes, the common beliefs. That's a perfect question. Um, what, I'd say the most common belief women hold that I hear, and I hear it every day when I get up and do a program uh, wherever I am in the country, um, because our launch right now is just in the U.S. Uh, but I, what I hear is, if men speak up and use their voices, they are viewed positively as being assertive. If women do, they are um, they're viewed as being aggressive or inappropriate. So we're in a no-win situation. I hear that yeah. over and over for women, and I strongly believe that you do yourself more potential harm in terms of achieving what you want to achieve in the world to back off because you're afraid of being viewed as uh, a, a aggressive or ambitious to just back off uh, and let yourself uh, to some degree be manipulated by that fear into not trying to have a maximum impact. Um, mm-hmm. There are many ways in which women can present their achievements can gain recognition for their achievements, can use their voices in a clear and persuasive way without being overly aggressive by presenting, um, uh, you know, information about what they have contributed as information rather than, you know, self-serving tidbits. Uh, so there are many ways that that can happen. And um, and I I really... I get discouraged when I see women backing off prematurely because they once got some feedback that said, oh, you were too aggressive or, you know, you should have backed off on that point. Um, there are many ways to do that. We have lots of examples in the book of women who learn to navigate that and do that successfully in a way that was comfortable for them. So I think that that is, um, is one of the uh, one of the things that real, the, the beliefs, if you will, that really does hold women back. There's no way I can be assertive and not be penalized for it. Another belief that holds women back is the belief that in order to succeed, they have to do everything perfectly. They have to, uh, every piece of work they have, ha, do has to re, be at the highest standard. Um, they have to become an expert in whatever they're doing. People become successful, uh, yes, by having some expertise, certainly, and doing the job well, but also by developing relationships, um, investing in those relationships by, by helping other people and asking for help, uh, and by working hard to make sure that their efforts are re- recognized and visible at the top. So when women are overly committed to the belief that they have to do everything perfectly and that they're going to be promoted or not based on whether they become an expert in the job they have, they shortchange themselves. For one thing, they 
basically, you know, when you're perfect with the job you have, you're only pr- proving you're perfect for the job you have. Uh, it doesn't indicate anything about the next job because that will have different skills. Um, and you may make yourself, and we see this a lot, indispensable to your boss um, if you're, you know, spend all your energy trying to be perfect at what you're doing. So looking up, starting to build allies and relationships from day one, um, asking people for help in uh, helping you to identify what you need to do to get where you want to go, and offering help to people, setting up those kind of easy, I don't want it to sound too transactional, but to some degree, you know, you help me and I'll help you relationships. That's usually how men um, have traditionally become successful, and it's a great path for women. And when women find a way to do that that's really comfortable for them, uh, the sky's the limit. Well, and so on that note, why do you think that some women are so reluctant to claim, you know, like their achievements and and be able to say, yeah, I, I did a great job with that? Yeah, again, I think there's some um, there's some uh, limiting uh, behaviors there. Um, I, it was interesting. I, I did a, a piece of work for a partnership firm a group of partnership firms a number of years ago, and one of the questions I asked the senior partners was, what are the younger women, the women not at partner level, what are they best at, and what, you know, where is the greatest challenge? And the answers to those questions were almost unanimous. They're best at doing A-plus quality work, at being conscientious, at showing up, at, um, at you know, working as hard as they can uh, to fulfill expectations. What they're worst at is getting known for the quality of their work. So when I ask, uh, I ask the, the younger women in the firms um, why they felt that if that if they identified with that, and um, and if so, why they thought they weren't very good at bringing bringing visibility to their achievements. Um, I heard one of two things. I heard you know either. Either uh, I, I don't want to ask if I have to act like that obnoxious jerk down the hall to get noticed around here. No, thank you. But that's you know that's really an either or way of thinking. You know, either you're the most obnoxious person in the entire organization, or you just keep your mouth shut. So that's setting up something that you really can't win. And the other thing I would hear was, I believe if I do great work, people should notice. And um, that's true. They they probably should, uh, and in an ideal world, they would. But in most organizations, especially today, when people are so busy and pressed for time, they usually don't notice what you're doing unless it directly affects them. So it really is your incumbent upon every one of us to find a way um, to bring attention to the, the quality of what we do. Because you know what? If we don't do that, then we don't get noticed or recognized for it. And then we start to feel bad. We start to detach. We start to think, oh, maybe I'm in the wrong place. Um, You know, maybe maybe my boss just is incapable of appreciating me. We can go down kind of a negative spiral of rumination and overthinking. So it's really important uh, to do that just for our own, um, not just for our own careers, but for our own real uh, mental health and the quality of our relationships um, to to focus some attention on on getting known for what you do, and um, rather than expecting others to spontaneously notice and value what you're contributing. Mm-hmm. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I think I have time for one more question before we go here. Gosh, we know that you're so busy helping <laughs> corporations all over the world, <laughs> you know, make, you. make great, impactful changes with, in, in regards to women and, and being in the workplace. So, you know, I know your book has these, has listed the, the different habits or 12 of them yes. that, you know, that we should take note of. Yes. Why don't you share with us one? that you um, find that, um, you know, that women maybe need to really pay attention to? Okay, sure. I think I've, I've touched on three probably, um, mm-hmm. you know, expecting others to notice, uh, uh, spontaneously notice and value your uh, contributions. 
overvaluing expertise and what we call the perfection trap. Uh, but another one that's very common is what we call in the book the disease to please. That is the desire to make sure that in all circumstances, everybody um, feels you've been a wonderful person. Uh, and that, um, and there are a lot of women who kind of fall into this feeling that their job is to always meet everybody else's expectations, even when those expectations um, may not be entirely realistic or even when they are almost projecting on other people what those expectations are. We have a wonderful example in the book of a, of a woman who was a, a hospital. She was the, the head of community relations for a big hospital system, and she was terrific. Everyone loved her in, in the community, the patients, their families. You know, she was asked to, you know, speak at every community event when it had to do with the hospital. She was just very loved. Um, and because she was so successful at it, she got a big promotion um, into the into the real senior leadership of of the hospital system. But as she did, she was so reluctant. She felt so guilty um, by not you know continuing to have these relationships and interact with the patients and especially the patient families that had depended upon her and with different people in the community, that what she found was that she was, in addition to doing this big job as a um, you know, member of the executive team, she was also still trying to do that job because she felt guilty. You know, families would say, well, we liked working with Deborah, and, you know, we're not certain about the new person. Can't Deborah help us? And she'd always say yes. And... Um, and and she was driving herself out of her mind and not doing a very good job with either in her efforts to please everyone. And finally, the the um, hospital system fire, hired a coach for her, and and the coach pointed out, you know, you got where you did because other people gave you a chance, and you're not giving anyone a chance. You're trying to do everybody else's job for them because other people seem to want that. Said, so, but that's not. You know, you, you, you can't let other people violate your boundaries like that. And you need to let, you know, younger people, the people have come in to do the job you used to have, do that job. Um, so she really began to think about it in terms of, of kind of her lack of boundaries was depriving other people of opportunities. And by the way, and this happens a lot, and I've seen it, as she got better at asserting her own boundaries and delegating tasks and holding other people to account for what she delegated, she also got a lot better at doing that in her family, and her family life um, improved. She was, in the same way, running herself ragged, trying to meet every expectation for her kids, even when it wasn't that important. I love that perspective that you talk about, because a lot of women that get into that trap don't realize that it's like, yeah, someone gave you an opportunity, but you're not giving somebody else an opportunity. You're trying to do it all yourself. And yes, that's exactly. so true. It is true. And it's a wonderful way for women to really understand why, what, if they're doing that, if they're behaving in that way, if they're exhibiting that habit, that it's not a good thing because, because women in general, you know, want to help. They want to please. Every single one of the behaviors in this book, all 12, mm-hmm. 12 of them, is also rooted in the strength uh, for women. And the, the disease to please, for example, is rooted in a very genuine and often compassionate desire to help other people and to be, to be there for them. So in the book, we're, we're certainly not ever uh, advocating a 180-degree turn uh, from, from the strength that have helped get you to where you are. Um, but we are, we're, we're showing how you can balance those with, with other habits and behaviors that will serve you more if you want to have a larger impact and achieve a more, um, a more satisfying, um, uh, position in life for yourself. Well, Sally, where can people connect with you and learn more about where they can um, not only be part of the community, but the book, How Women Rise? Well, three things. The book, How Women Rise, is, is 
basically available everywhere. Um, you mm-hmm. know, it's available all online retailers, in many bookstores. I'm seeing it practically every airport I'm in, which is kind of a thrill or train station. Um, so it's easily, uh, it's very easy to get. Um, we also offer a discussion guide uh, because we're, we're getting lots of um, email and LinkedIn uh, notes saying, oh, I want to use this as, in my women's book group or, or my, my our book group in our organization this month. Um, so we've dis- de- developed a discussion guide, which we're going to be putting online and on our website. It's not up yet, but I'm very glad to send it to anybody who gets in touch with me. And in terms of getting in touch, my website is Sally helgeson.com um, and has a contact button. You can reach me there. My email is sally at sallyhelgeson.com. And uh, although I'm on all the social media platforms, the one I really interact with is, is LinkedIn. So uh, people can also uh, send me an invitation on LinkedIn and uh, uh, we can get the, keep the conversation going. Well, I'm connected with you on social media. I highly suggest everyone do the same. You know, Sally, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you, Marianne. You've been a wonderful interviewer, and it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you for your kind words, Sally. It's been such a joy to spend this time with you and to talk about your book, How Women Rise. Again, It's a great book to pick up for anyone in the workplace, and if you have teams or you're just wanting to know how to be a better leader, it's a must-read. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.